The emergency alert on my phone went off with a shrill noise, repeating three times and vibrating angrily, just as I was bringing the last of my belongings into the cabin. I took the device from my pocket and stared at it in disbelief for at least a minute before the realization set in that I would have to leave, only moments after arriving. My hands were shaking from the cold as I read through it again. Severe weather alert. Heavy snowfall in the Frontenac region is expected to begin tomorrow. 60 to 80 centimeters of precipitation. Not good. I realized the roads would be impassable by this time the following day. That meant I would have to leave early the next morning to avoid being stuck on the roads in the blizzard. Which, subsequently, meant zero ice fishing time for me. I'd be lucky to make it home before it started coming down in earnest. Moments later, messages started coming in from my three friends who had planned to join me. The group chat notification popped up on my phone and I opened it. Matt, did you see the emergency alert about the storm? I guess the trip's off. A bunch of bullshit. Ted, OMFG. A generational storm is what they're calling it now. Looks like we'll have to postpone for a few weeks. I hope you didn't go through with your plan to go up a day early, Jay. Greg, no kidding. What are the chances this blizzard hits on our ice fishing weekend? I messaged back saying I understood we'd have to reschedule. I told him I'd made the trip alone, accompanying the messages with forehead-slapping emojis. It sucks that I'll be stuck up here alone, I thought to myself. My dog Gibson pawed at my leg and I smiled at her, feeling slightly reassured by her presence. Yeah, you're right, Gibby. I'm not completely alone. At least I've got you here with me. After putting down a bowl of water and another containing kibble, my next priority was to start a fire in the small black stove at the center of the main living area. There was wood stacked up in a neat pile next to it, small bags containing kindling, which we brought with us in the summer and left behind. At first glance, it looked like a large enough stack, but I knew from experience that I would need twice as much as it appeared to make it through the night. So I went outside to gather more from beneath the boathouse. The family cottage was a rustic one, to put it mildly. There was no running water, no electricity, and the cabin was poorly insulated. Perennially procrastinated repairs were needed in more than one place, including the floor beneath one bed which had partially collapsed, letting in a slight trickle of cold air from outside. It was drafty and I could hear the sounds of mice, which made their way in through the gaps burrowing in the bedroom and finding their way into an old coat or a sleeping bag that someone had left behind. I sighed, lighting the kerosene lamps which were scattered on wobbly tables around the main living area. There was something about having mice in the cottage that set me on edge, but at least Gibson's presence would keep them at a distance. After filling the place with a warm, flickering glow from a half-dozen kerosene lamps, I felt a little better. There was reassurance in having a fire, and I started working on making a big one in the stove that would keep me warm through the night. I loosely wadded up some newspaper, and then stacked dry kindling on top, making a teepee. Over that, I added larger pieces of wood until it was piled up to the ceiling of the small stove. Then I lit a strip of cardboard and held it up to the paper inside, catching it alight from several places watching as it began to burn, and then flared up in a bright, white-orange glow. Holding my hands up to the fire, I watched it and warmed myself up. Eventually, I took off my boots and coat, the entire cottage gradually getting toasty. Eh, There's no sense unpacking, I thought, taking out a beer and opening it. I took a sip, couldn't help but grimace at the taste. I'd never tried this particular brand before and picked it up on a recommendation. 
It was terrible. And lukewarm to boot. Par for the course, considering the trip so far. I took up my phone and watched Netflix while the beer went flat inside me. I lifted Gibson up onto the futon with me, so that she was off the floor and close to the fire where it was warm. Eventually, I got bored of office reruns and called it a night, adding another log to the fire and reminding myself to wake up in an hour to keep it going. Pulling the futon ever closer to the stove so that it was as close to the fire as safety would allow, I curled up in my sleeping bag and drifted off into an uncomfortable slumber, constantly tossing and turning, trying to stay warm but not succeeding. I woke up to the sound of whining coming from Gibson, trembling on the bed beside me. I was so cold I was actually scared. My teeth were chattering uncontrollably, and I realized hours had passed. The fire had gone out completely, reduced to mere embers at the base of the stove. I quickly put on my jacket and blew hot breath onto my fingers, pulling Gibson closer to me. She was shaking badly as well. My hands were trembling as I put more newspaper and kindling onto the fire, blowing into the embers and hoping they would reignite. My lungs felt frozen, my heart was beating fast, my skin prickling with pins and needles, turning into total numbness in my extremities. I'd never felt so cold in my life and realized it was far beyond the weather forecasted on the news. It seemed like it was minus 30 degrees and steadily dropping further. Terrified that I would not be able to get my body temperature back up, my mind started racing, thinking of worst-case scenarios. If I couldn't stop shaking pretty soon, it would be impossible to light a fire again. I recalled that my truck was just outside and I could get in there and start it up turning on the heat until I felt warm again. But the idea of getting out there and the truck refusing to start was too much to take. And considering the state of the beat-up old four, that seemed like a distinct possibility in this cold. So I continued stoking the fire, blowing on the precious few embers and adding more newspaper every so often, until a tiny flame began to sputter and grow. I held my shaking hands up to the measly fire and added pieces of kindling sparingly, one by one, terrified of it going out again. Pulling Gibson closer, we shared each other's warmth and I began to feel half-human again. And then a sound came from outside the cabin suddenly, startling me and causing me to jump, my heart skipping a beat then pounding faster and faster in my chest. A noise like long fingernails being dragged across the siding could be heard from all around, echoing in the small space. Something was going from one end of the cottage to the other, attempting to get inside. Deep, guttural breathing could be heard, grunting and snorting, desperate as it scraped its talons against the boarded-up windows. Gibson began to whine, making high-pitched noises as she huddled closer to me and I put my hand over her muzzle, muffling her sounds. Was it a bear? I wondered and realized I was holding my breath. I thought about the holes in the flimsy facade of the cabin, the spot beneath the bed where mice were getting in. I thought about the broken screen door and the wooden one behind that, which needed to be replaced, almost falling off its rusty hinges. The entire cottage felt so frail and insecure all of a sudden as I heard the loud noise of whatever that thing was breathing heavily just outside and trying to get in. Maybe it was too cold out there even for it. The ground shook with the weight of the creature as it made its way around the cabin. I was so focused on it that I didn't notice the fire going out again at first as it fizzled down to embers. I continued holding my breath until it was gone, and then I relit the fire, my shaking hands barely able to get it going again. Once it was burning hot, I didn't sleep anymore. I pulled Gibson close, and the two of us stayed up all night watching the fire with weary eyes, and taking occasional glances at the door. Even once we were both warm, we continued to shiver. When the sun came up, at first I didn't notice it. It was dark in the cottage one minute, and then it was light. 
I blinked my eyes a few times and rolled out of bed, deciding I would waste no more time before leaving. I just hoped the bear, or whatever had been outside the night before, was gone. Gibson was scratching at the front door, asking to be let outside to pee, which told me it was probably safe now. In the light of the morning, all that had happened seemed like a bad nightmare. I told myself maybe it had been. That was until I got outside and saw the claw marks which marred the exterior walls. Shuddering, I threw my belongings in the truck, doused the fire with too much water, and took one last look at the place. What a shitty weekend this turned out to be, I thought to myself. With more people around, it was easier to keep the fire going, taking turns, feeding it with wood so that everyone could sleep through the night. But it was frightening being up here by myself, even with Gibson by my side. I'd never done it before in the winter, and I never would again. There were too many things that could go wrong. A freak snowstorm, a fallen tree blocking the road, getting stuck or going into a ditch. And those were just the beginning. I wanted to get out of here before any of those things happened. The truck didn't want to start at first. I turned the key in the ignition twice, hearing only a click, and the absence of any engine noise. Cursing loudly, I checked to make sure I hadn't left an interior light on, or something which could have drained the battery. Satisfied there was still a charge, I tried once more, and finally the old shitbox let out a cough and kicked into life. The engine began to sputter before finally settling into a steady, rusted purr. All right, Gibson, let's get out of here, I said, rubbing the dog's head and smiling as she blinked her eyes. She looked content in the front seat, happy to be back in the truck and out of the old cottage. There was a thin layer of snow on the gravel road and the tires got moving easily enough. I looked up to see the sky was turning gray above me and a few white flakes were just beginning to fall. The weather was making an early appearance. I turned on the radio and sure enough they said the same thing I was thinking. The snow would be arriving early. By noon the highway would be a parking lot. Whiteout conditions, be prepared to be trapped in your car and have emergency supplies ready. My anxiety was through the roof as I went around a bend in the hill. Hitting the gas, I came to the first big rise and went over it, seeing something strange up ahead as I came over the rise. Whatever it was, it was blocking the road. Massive and brown, the lumpy, furry shape got bigger as I pulled up in front of it. The bear, which had been trying to get into my cottage the night before, was dead lying in the middle of the gravel road and blocking it completely. At first I thought it was frozen to death. I got out of my truck to inspect it and was surprised to find there was a horrible smell coming from the carcass. It was a chemical smell. Noxious and unpleasant like some sort of factory waste. The snow had melted all around the beast and blood and entrails were pooling around the far side. What the hell could do such a thing? I thought to myself. Aren't bears at the top of the food chain? Alpha predators? Gibson was by my side, but she did not venture near the body. Usually she would be curious about something like this, trying to sniff at it, but instead she stayed back, emitting a low growl. The road was completely blocked, I realized. There was no way out. Not unless I could move the body of a giant bear. No matter which way I attempted it, it would not budge. It weighed a ton, literally. There were large trees on either side of the road, no way to get past. There was only one other way out, which was by driving across the frozen lake, and that was risky. I hadn't been able to test the thickness of the ice yet. It would need to be nearly a foot deep for me to feel comfortable. There was a clear way on and off the ice if it came down to it, though. I got back in the truck and threw it in reverse since there was nowhere to turn around. 
I felt sick to my stomach, nervous with anticipation and fear. Uncertain of how I was going to get out of here. Once back in front of the cottage, I got out of my truck and went down to the ice with my spud. Walking out onto the lake, I cleared a spot with my boot and began to dig with the sharpened metal rod. Satisfied that I'd found the bottom of the ice, I put the tape measure through the hole, hoping it would be close to a foot. Looking at the tape measure, my heart sank. The ice was barely seven inches thick. Just below the minimum eight inches, where it would be safe to drive a vehicle across. And my truck was on the heavier side, I would feel more comfortable if it was a full th- foot thick or more. I pulled out my phone and checked for a signal, deciding it was time to call someone for help. Who I would call, I still wasn't sure, but I knew I couldn't get out of this jam by myself. Of course. I muttered out loud, seeing the signal bar was down to zero, and the words, no service, were printed across the top of the screen. Surely I would have gotten another severe weather alert by now, I realized had it not been for the total lack of cell signal. Because snow was now being dumped down on me from above, and the sky had turned nearly black with the approaching storm. I typed out a message in the group chat telling them my situation, hitting send regardless of the lack of signal. I knew from experience that it would go through eventually, and I just hoped it would be sooner rather than later. Gibson let out a loud, high-pitched whine, Her tone rose in volume and she began to bark. High, persistent yips that were totally unlike her. She backed away, then let out a stream of urine, her hind legs trembling as she did. I looked up from my phone and saw what her eyes had spotted. Across the lake, something was moving in the trees. I saw fingers wrapping around a tree trunk too high up. The nails too long, too sharp to be a person's. Whatever this giant was, it looked similar to a man, but it was massive. It peered out at me from between the boughs of trees, its head probably 15 feet off the ground. Its skeletal limbs matched the monochromatic tone of the birches on either side of it, a gray, pale white shade. I couldn't distinguish the entire form of it in the shadows, but I could make it its eyes. They reflected back at me, catching the gray light coming through the clouds. And then I saw its mouth spread even wider in a grin, teeth dripping blood, and it disappeared back into the darkness. The temperature felt like it had dropped to 30 below freezing again, as I began to shiver involuntarily and looked down to see Gibson was doing the same. There was only one choice. Only one place we could go. The cabin. It was either that or risk the truck plunging into a frozen lake, attempting to drive across. We were on a small peninsula surrounded by water on all sides with only one way in or out. And that way was blocked by the body of a giant brown bear. I took the dog back inside the cottage and locked the doors, taking uneasy glances outside through the cracks in the boarded-up windows. What the hell was that thing in the forest? I asked myself over and over again, but no answer came to mind. There was no creature I could think of that was 15 feet tall with reflective eyes, which stood on two legs like a man, capable of disemboweling a full-grown bear capable of causing the temperature to plunge all around me. There was only one creature capable of that, and it wasn't supposed to exist. It was something from myth and from folklore, from legends that aren't supposed to be real. It's a wendigo, I said aloud, immediately regretting the words as if saying them made it true, as if saying them would summon it. Wendigos are supernatural creatures, born of Canadian First Nations folklore. They live in cold, remote places and make people go mad merely through their presence. 
They thrive on the hunger, despair, and loneliness of their victims, who usually live in remote communities. They drive families apart, instilling urges of cannibalism in people and making them want to consume their own loved ones during the lean, hard months of winter. They turn people into raving cannibals, driving away all their loved ones. And then, once you're alone, the Wendigo strikes. It either consumes you while you're still alive, tearing the flesh from your bones while you beg and scream, or it turns you into one of its own kind. But the Wendigo's greatest curse is that no matter how much flesh it consumes, it only grows hungrier. With every ounce of meat it takes in, it grows taller and more emaciated. Its hunger grows more insatiable with its height, until it is a towering beast with its head amongst the treetops, as it roams the forest, constantly searching for its next meal. Gibson whimpered and burrowed her face into my armpit, as if hearing my inner thoughts. Trying to reassure her, I stoked her fur and told her it would be okay, although I had a feeling it wouldn't be. I tried to get the fire going again, but it was a fruitless effort. Everything inside the stove was damp and wet, and I scolded myself for dousing the fire with so much water. Still, I kept at it, knowing we might be stuck there for a while. Pretty soon the wind was howling and blowing outside, and the snow was piling up in front of the door. I made a point of keeping it open, every so often and clearing the steps, knowing that I would need firewood, taking weary glances off into the forest across the lake as I did so. Finally, I got the fire started, a low, guttering flame in the stove, which wanted to go out all the time. Everything was damp, but I kept feeding fresh kindling into it, nursing it until it kept going by itself. Hours passed as we waited to either run out of firewood or be attacked by the creature. We were running low on kindling, and the sun was beginning to set again. My stomach was rumbling with hunger when I felt something strange. The ground was suddenly shaking beneath my feet, and I heard Gibson whining from beside me. What is it, girl? I asked, my voice catching in my throat as I realized the answer. It was the creature. It was back. The dining table began to rattle and bounce up and down as whatever was outside got closer, and I imagined the huge creature lifting the roof from the cabin like the cloche on a dish in a fancy restaurant, picking me up and eating me whole like a wriggling shrimp. A second later there was a sound at the front door of metal being ripped and sheared as I realized the creature was making its way in. The screen door landed on the ground with a crash, and then the wooden door was being torn from its hinges an instant later. Cold air rushed inside as Gibson began to let out shrill, panicked barks of terror. I could hear the thing tearing apart the front entrance, easily ripping apart the wood and making the doorway larger so that it could come inside. I tipped over the dining room table to use it as a barricade. I picked up a chair, the only weapon I could find nearby, thinking I would throw it at the thing's face to defend us. When I heard a strange noise coming from out front. It was a car horn honking. Someone had come to save us. I heard a loud ding and pulled out my phone and saw the green check mark beside my group chat message, indicating at some point it had gone through, and at some brief moment there had been a gap in the clouds. Reading the one new message received on my phone, a hopeful smile spread across my face. Matt, you just had to skip town a day early and go ice fishing, didn't you? What the hell is that thing? Ted was yelling from outside. I don't know, but it's trying to get inside. Jay, are you there? I shouted back that I was. There was a loud screech from outside, which I realized had come from the monster. They had actually wounded it somehow. I ran to the front door with Gibson and looked up, seeing the creature for the first time, clearly. It stood with its back to us its head among the treetops even taller than it had appeared at first. My friends had caught it off guard, but now I was fully aware of them, and it was going after them. The Wendigo was distracted by something in front of the cottage, and I realized one of my friends had gotten out of the car and they were using themselves as bait, so that the two of us could flee the cottage safely. 
they had driven across the ice with their lighter vehicle, just as I had hoped to do. I guess that they'd also run into trouble moving the body of the giant bear, which had blocked the road. Jay! Ted screamed out the window, driving the car in circles on the ice, as if too terrified to stay still. I raced over to the car, slipping and sliding on the lake ice. It was Matt, who was distracting the Wendigo, I realized, and I called for him to get away from the thing. It was too large and too fast, and he didn't know what he was dealing with. But that was Matt. He was always the act-first, think-later type. Not only that, but he often put himself in harm's way for his friends. He turned to look and gave me a quick thumbs up, his attention diverted from the creature for a split second too long. As Gibson and I got back into the car, I heard his screams, and I looked to see the Wendigo had closed the distance in an instant and was picking him up like an insect, turning him and taking bites from him in places. As Matt screamed for help, the creature began to peel off his skin, exposing his shining skull as he ate his face. The calls for help turned to bubbling gurgles, and then wet choked sounds as I got out of the car and went to run after him, but Ted grabbed my wrist and pulled me back inside. You can't save him, he said with wet, red-rimmed eyes, and eventually I relented. We raced away across the icy lake, making a path through the blizzard, cutting a swath out of the fresh-fallen snow on our way back to the main roads. For a while, we debated what to do. Should we call the police? Our friend had just died, after all. But we knew that if we did, we would be considered suspects. With no other reasonable explanation, they would probably pin the death on us. They would say we killed him. There was no box you could check on an official police report citing a Wendigo attack, after all. They would think we were crazy. Those things didn't exist. They were myths. Legends. But, as it turned out, we wouldn't have to worry about it. A message pop up on my phone from Matt on the group chat just a few minutes after we got home. And I had to tell myself it wasn't all just a nightmare. A hallucination from the cold, from lack of sleep and food. But Greg and Ted both told me I hadn't imagined it. What we saw was real, as much as I wish it wasn't. The three of us read the message on the group chat again and again. My heart was beating fast and a sick knot was growing my stomach, bile rising in my throat that I could taste in my mouth. Matt. Hey guys, you really missed out on a feast. Ice fishing is just as much fun in a blizzard, if not more. Let's reschedule the trip for next weekend, okay? I'll be waiting for you here. As much as we don't want to go, we've resolved that we have to. We can't leave Matt like that. We have to help him. So next weekend, we're making the trip back up there. Even if it kills us. <laughs>